This episode is brought to you by Stars. Lisa Tadeo's best selling book is about to become your favorite new show. Based on a true story, the new Stars original series, Three Women, stars Shailene Woodley as Gia, a grieving and struggling writer who embarks on a cross country road trip where she meets three women determined to radically change their lives. This one is not to be missed. Watch the season premiere of Three Women now, only on Stars and the Stars app. It's the Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Welcome back to Mutual Presents. I'm Jack Ward, and I'm here with my theater-hopping companion, Penny the Cat. You know, Penny is getting up there in years, and... Sometimes she has a little nap, one might say even a cat nap, during our double features. But she's always awake for First Nighter, especially for one of our favorites, including Love is Stranger Than Fiction and Oh Bury Me Not. So wind back those clocks and let's get on with the show. Campana's First Nighter Program. From the Little Theater of Times Square. Starring Olin Soule and Barbara Luddy with an all-star cast presented by Campana, the quality name in cosmetics. <laughs> theater Time, Broadway. And tonight a new play is scheduled for its premiere performance at the Little Theater of Times Square. If you've never attended an opening night on the Great White Way, then you have the treat of a lifetime in store for you. And here is our host for the evening, the genial First Nighter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Traffic is slow these wintry nights, so let's be off to an early start, shall we? My cab is waiting. Won't you step in? All right, driver, to the little theater. <laughs> Up Broadway, across 42nd Street, past the Paramount Theater, the Astor Hotel. And now, just ahead, is the little theater off Times Square. Well, here we are. Tickets ready, please. Good evening, Mr. First Nighter. The usher will show you to your seats. Thank you. We'll go right in. Here we are in excellent seats, and I must say that this is a typically fashionable First Nighter audience. Glamorous ladies are exhibiting fortunes in jewels and furs. There's one of those fabulously expensive mink wraps right across the aisle from me. But let's get down to the business of the evening. I see Frank Worth conducting the famous First Nighter Orchestra. And here's the news about the play. It's a brand new comedy romance called Love is Stranger Than Fiction, written by Irvin Title, and co-starring Olin Soule and Barbara Luddy. Mr. Soule is cast as Mr. Blake, the publisher. Miss Luddy plays the role of Louise, his secretary. And the supporting cast is a star-studded roster, too, including Herb Butterfield, Willard Waterman, Virginia Gregg, Jerry Hausner, and other famous names. And now it's just about time for the curtain to rise. Signal for first curtain, the house lights are out, and here's the play. Louise, look at that, will you? What book heads the best sellers in Terre Haute? Purple Petals by Phoebe St. Clair, published by All Sop Brothers. In Pittsburgh, Purple Petals. In Montreal, Hartford, and Gary, Indiana? Purple Petals by Phoebe St. Clair. Yeah, well, don't stand there repeating my words. Benson and Blake is supposed to be the most aggressive publishing house in the business, and we haven't had a bestseller in two years. Then an upstart firm like Allsop Brothers steals this book from right under our noses. Our noses? Mr. Alan Blake, I've been your secretary long enough for you to know that I insist on accuracy from an employer above all else. Well, what do you mean? Didn't we turn down the... We didn't. When I gave you the Purple Petals manuscript, attached to it were three enthusiastic reports from our three readers and a note of mine. Remember what it said? Uh, well, it's easy to say I told you so. It it's said, all... I wish I'd written this book because it'll sell a million copies. Remember what you said. Well, how on earth do you expect me you to... You said it reminded you of a boiled orange, very soggy pap colored on the outside. Yeah. So I did, and so it is. Yeah, it's in its eighth printing inside a year. Movie rights sold for half a million, and you turned it down. Uh, must have been smoking hashish. But who is Phoebe St. Clair? 
If we could only find her and tell her that some unauthorized maniac in our office rejected her book, then maybe we'd have a chance at her next one. Well, you've spent scads of B&B's money for detectives to watch the Alsop offices to see if they could discover who Miss Sinclair is. Uh, I've tried everything and not a clue. She hates publicity. Oh, Louise, I've known for some time that Joe Alsop has offered you everything but their printing presses to work for him. Why do you stick here? Oh, I'm just contrary. Or maybe it's that old proverb about rats and a sinking ship. Listen, if we don't get a book that'll sell soon, there just won't be a ship. You want to look at this manuscript now, Mr. Blake? Oh, frankly, Miss Jones, no. What is it? It's called Hard Flows the Sea by a new writer, Stephen Shad Stronghurst. What do you think of it? Well, honestly, I don't remember when I've been so excited about a book. Uh, that's what you said about ten acres, and look what that turkey did to us. Well, it's not my opinion alone this time. Both Henderson and Simon have written two pages about it. Well, that's always a help. At least we're sure of three sales if we publish it. Now, what's this? Oh, well, Louise read it, too. That's her comment. Hmm. Last time I said, I wish I'd written this book because it'll sell a million copies. At the risk of repeating myself, I'm repeating myself. Louise. Hmm. Anything else, Mr. Blake? No, no. Just tell the switchboard I'm not to be disturbed for the next three hours. But look, Alan, it's after five, and I got a very important date with a very important girl. I don't care if you've got an important date with Rita Hayworth. You stay right here. Oh, well, why me? I'm going to miss the 540. Harry, you know what... you're our publicity director, and this manuscript is so hot, I want you to start thinking about angles pronto. We're putting all our eggs in this 400-page basket. Uh, what's the masterpiece about? Oh, Harry, it's about life and love and all the elements. It's a roisterous, boisterous sea story, and the smell of salt spray stings your eyes as you read it. And after you wipe your eyes, then what? It's Conrad and Jack London and Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, plus women. And in Technicolor. Harry, get on your typewriter. I want the big treatment. Well, I'm glad you agree with me this time that it's a great book. Great book? Why, I couldn't sleep last night just thinking about the possibilities. I'm getting this man Stronghurst down here immediately. Have you contacted him? I'm sending him a wire. I've come to the conclusion that the book must be the story of his own life. The life of a reckless, two-fisted, elemental man who could stun a steer with a blow of his fist. A man who could crush a coconut with one calloused hand. But you've never seen Stronghurst. Maybe he's five foot two and talks with a lisp. Oh. <laughs> you disgust me. Here, write this down. Uh, Stephen Shad Stronghurst, at first sight strikes you as the sort of man about whom legends gather and grow. The story that he uh, crushes coconuts in one calloused hand, apocryphal as it may sound, is the most obvious thing in the world the moment your hand disappears in his immense paw when you introduced. He uh, is an elemental man. Uh, come in. Will you initial this wire before I send it off, Mr. Blake? Uh, read it to me first, Miss Jones. Mr. Stephen Shad Stronghurst, Box 652, Main Post Office. Your manuscript, Hard Flows the Sea, has vague possibilities. Please drop in this week for a chat. Signed, Alan Blake, Benson and Blake Publishing. You don't want to give Mr. Stronghurst any false hopes, do you? Vague possibilities. The only vague thing about it is who will take the lead when the movies get it, Gary Cooper or Ariel Flynn. Lou, I think you've got a point there. Miss Jones, take out the word vague. And, um, let me see, this week, that's too indefinite. Make it immediately. How does that sound, Lou? Very cordial. Qu that's an idea. Sign it. Very cordially yours. How's that, Lou? Fine. That'll tell him in a lukewarm sort of way that you worship the very keys his calloused fingers type on. I'm sorry, sir, but our mailboxes are strictly private. No information as to identity can be divulged. <laughs> I'm not asking for information. I want to meet Mr. Stronghurst of Box 652. He ignores my wires and my letters. I just want to speak to the man, that's all. Well, I'm sorry, sir. This is a post office, not a date bureau. Goodbye. So, of all the galling, nerve-wracking experiences, this one... 
Yes? Mr. Howard Creighton, literary editor of the Daily News, is on the other line, Mr. Blake. Well, put him on. Hello, Howard. How are you? Blake, you've got something in this Stronghurst saga. I like it. I'm going to say so in my column. How about a thumbnail biography of the man? I've sent over a character sketch by special delivery. Is it 10% true? Howard, this is too important a thing to joke about. Steve Stronghurst is a simple, down-to-earth man's man. He's been all over the world, mostly traveling steerage. What else has he written? Well, not a thing. Needed money one day, locked himself up in a cheap bistro in Marseille, and batted this book out on a portable pilfered from the local gendarmerie. That's the kind of fellow he is. What kind of jobs has he held? You name them, we got them. He was a bullfighter in Spain, a medicine man in Africa, a monk in Tibet, and taught physics at USC. <laughs> Sounds fabulous enough. What does he look like? Howard, think of the statue of a Greek god. Put some clothes on it, and that's our Steve Stronghurst. You should see his hands, Howard. Great calloused paws that crush a coconut as easily as you or I do an egg. Well, the egg and we. You don't say. You know, Blake... If you're not careful, you're liable to have a bestseller on your hands. And the curtain comes down on the first act of tonight's play in the little theater off Times Square. Smoking in the outer lobby or downstairs only, please. Smoking in the outer lobby. Now I see someone approaching with a stealthy tread. Yes, it's Larry Keating and a guest. Tell me, Mr. Keating, I've heard so much about magic touch. Campana's new cream makeup. Is it so very different from other makeups? It's so different that you'll never believe how much prettier it will make you until you try it. Magic Touch is a cream complexion makeup that you apply with your fingertips. No powder puff, no water. You can use it anytime, anywhere. And it literally performs magic for your complexion. Gives you that new complexion loveliness that women are demanding today. The unmade-up look. Magic Touch provides a feminine, delicate, fragile makeup beauty. The Dresden doll-like complexion that women are seeking. What does it look like? Magic Touch is a wafer-thin cream in a beautiful white and gold compact. It offers you six new complexion flattering shades. All you do is stroke your fingertips across the surface of the cream, apply to your face, and blend. Magic Touch contains a new magic ingredient that causes it to blend better than any cream makeup yet invented. Do I use powder, too? No, if you want the new luminous effect, and I don't mean shiny. Yes, if you want to give your complexion a matte finish. Either way, Magic Touch gives you a new, flawless-looking complexion. Is Magic Touch very expensive? Surprisingly inexpensive. You get a large-size, classic, golden-white compact of Magic Touch for only one dollar. I'm going to try it tomorrow. And believe me, you'll never know how pretty you can be until you do. First nighters are hurrying down the aisles to their seats. The lights are dimmed, and here's the second act of Love is Stranger Than Fiction. Lou, I'm desperate. I've heard from most of the book critics in the country, and they're all mad about the advanced copies of Hard Close the Sea. Then why the desperation? You should be jumping with joy. Joy? Two weeks before publication, I haven't even seen the author to confirm any part of the phony stories I've been broadcasting about him. Hasn't bothered answering my last 20 wires. Well, I've been trying to tell you, Mr. Blake, that Mr. Stephen Shad Stronghurst has answered your last desperate, frantic, pathetic telegram. What? Well, why didn't you... For heaven's sake, quick, what does he say? We'll arrive tomorrow, 3 p.m., for interview. Demand absolute privacy. No photographers, no office staff. Wire acceptance of conditions or else. Or else what? Or else, period. (laughs) He must have run out of words. Of all the nerve... What does he want me to do, shut down for half a day? What does he mean, no photographers? If he, for one solitary minute, thinks that I... 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 Yes? I've run out of words. Why, are okay. Come in, come in. Yes, sir, come right in. Have I the pleasure of addressing... What are you doing here? Shh. Mr. Stronghurst is coming. Louise, I thought I told you to go on home. I promised Shh. the man. Right this way, Mr. Stronghurst. Mr. Alan Blake, Mr. Stephen Stronghurst. Well, Lou, you idiot, open the door so he can come in. He is in. Mr. Stronghurst, say something to pop-eyed Mr. Blake. 
How do you do, Mr. Blake? Will you shake one of my calloused hands? Not this one, this one, the one I use for coconut crushing. <clears throat> if this is your idea of a joke, Louise, it's gone too far, and I order you to open that door this minute. You mean you want me to open the door and leave? I do. You came here against my orders just so you could meet Stronghurst, and I won't stand for it. You'll be here any minute. Miss Turner, leave this office at once. Louise, uh, Miss Turner, you're fired. Am I really? Well, now, that's awkward. What shall I do with all those pleading wires you sent me? Of course, if I went down the street to Alsop Brothers, I'd get a much warmer welcome. They're used to publishing bestsellers. Good heavens. Really, Louise, you're... You're fooling. Surely you can't be... Tell me, you're not... You're getting warm. I'm Stephen Shad Stronghurst, and I couldn't even crush a peanut with one hand. Oh... I don't know a Tibetan monk from an Indian medicine man, and I've only seen Marseille in postcards. But I, I still don't understand. I do my research in travel magazines. The salt spray that stung your eyes as you read my novel was stale eau de cologne. Well, it, it seems incredible. The nearest I've come to a notion was five years ago when I tried Shad Row, and I didn't like it. But, Louise, when could you have... I write in the evenings and on my weekends, but you wouldn't know that. You've never shown any interest in what I do with my evenings or weekends. Lou, I, I don't know what to say, but it's, it's just wonderful. Hello, Mr. Blake. I just happened to be passing by with my camera, and I... Oh, hello, Lou. Say, where's the big shot author? I got my camera all primed and ready, too. Goodbye, Mike. Glad you dropped yeah, in. Yeah, but you gave me the signal. You shouted, it's wonderful. So I came in, ready to get a couple of fast shots. So, photographers lying in wait outside after you made a solemn promise, Alan Blake, of all the cheap, contemptible... Now, Lou, please, all I now, want Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter with photographers? What's fighting you, kid? I'm fed up. Private secretary and shoulder to weep on for four years. I give him a novel I've slaved over that he'll make a fortune out of, and he, he lies to me. I'm through. Oh, Louise, now listen to me. I didn't mean to lie to you. You've got my signature on this one, Alan Blake, but from now on, the B&B &B publishing company can go hang. <laughs> Benson and Blake Publishing, International Majestic Studios, offer six hundred thousand for movie rights to Heart Flows the Sea. Benson and Blake Publishing must have at least twelve hundred more copies. Heart Flows the Sea, Express, Collect, Rush, National Book Club, Washington D.C. <laughs> Benson and Blake, rush thousand copies, hard flows the sea to clear backlog, unfilled orders, advise new printing. Yes, Mr. Blake, I tried Louise Turner's old address and the superintendent had no oh, idea. Oh, what about the post office? They said all her mail addressed to box 652 is sent out to her address, but it's against the rules. Well, I've simply got to see her. I can't seem to get anything done around here anymore. Thank you, Miss Jones. That's all, Miss Jones. Uh, Miss Jones, ask the switchboard to get me Howard Creighton, literary editor of the Daily News. Mr. Blake, Louise Turner's on the other line. Well, at last, let me speak to her. Hello. Hello, Louise. Alan Blake, if I were in your office right now, I'd slap your face. I... How could you do such a thing? Oh, Lou, now, please, Lou. I was desperate. I couldn't get a hold of you. I had to do something. So you fed the newspapers another pack of lies. I don't mind your telling them I'm Stronghurst, but the nerve... Oh, Lou, you... please, don't you understand? I spent a week trying to trace then you. Then you released the yarn about me peddling hard flows to see to 20 other publishers. Oh. And how, against the judgment of your associates, and more out of sympathy than conviction, you published my book. Louise, I knew that if those fake stories about you were published in the newspapers, you'd get in touch with me. I'm the poor, stupid, struggling author who'd still be living in a garret if it wasn't for Alan Blake, the selfless, altruistic, philanthropic publisher. Oh, Louise, believe me, the only reason I said all that was to make you call me. Right now, there are a lot of things I'd like to call you. But the only reason I did was to say goodbye. Goodbye. And the curtain comes down on the second act of tonight's play in the Little Theater off Times Square. Smoking down. And here again is the intermission that brings us our good friend, Larry Keating. Yes, ladies, thousands upon thousands of you from East Coast to West Coast have said how glad you are that your favorite hand lotion, Italian Balm, is back again in the stores. Made exactly as it was before the war. I know a lot of children who are glad, too. Children's hands, wrists, and legs get chapped so easily in winter. 
And Italian balm is so soothing, so protecting on children's tender skins. Men also are glad to have Italian balm back again. Men don't like dry, chapped, red, beefy-looking hands any better than anyone else. And they know that Italian balm, rich, concentrated, clean-smelling, is the lotion to use in the wintertime. It's so different from thin, watery lotion. So economical, too. Remember, just one drop serves both hands. Today, Italian balm offers the same pre-war quality, same pre pre-war quantity at the same pre-war price. Can you beat that for hand lotion value? Try it tomorrow. Italian bomb. Curtain! Last curtain! The first nighters are all in their seats, ready for the last act. And there goes the curtain. Alan, as the junior member of Alsop Brothers and uh, as a rival publisher, I, I'd like to congratulate you on the success of your recent bestseller, Hard Flows the Sea. <laughs> Lucky stiff. Uh... Now, what's wrong with the luck of the Alsop Brothers? Last season you had the giant fell down and this season purple petals. Oh, I'm not complaining. I only begrudge you your blind luck, that's all. <laughs> We publish her first book, and then she turns around and says number two is not for us. <laughs> Loyalty, she says. Who's she? Oh, Phoebe St. Clair, of course. Who? <laughs> In the way you spent money trying to track down the author, who was none other than your own private secretary. That was the biggest laugh. Hey, just a minute. What are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't turn it down. I published Hard Flows the Sea. Hard Flows the Sea? Yeah. I'm talking about Purple Petals. Lou said you yourself next it. And what happened? She dropped in our lap the biggest moneymaker since Gone with the Wind. Oh, Louise, it's Phoebe St. Clair, too. Oh, yes, it was very funny, wasn't it? Well, after that first brush off, how you persuaded her to give you a Hard Flows the Sea is... One of those unsolved mysteries. Yes, well, I didn't expect you to understand it. Personally, I think she's carrying this loyalty thing too far. She worked for you for four years, yes, but, but so what? Yeah, don't think I didn't know you were trying to bribe her to work for you, because I... No, 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 she said, uh, Joe, in spite of everything, I'm offering my next novel to B&B. I, I owe that much to them. She calls you Joe. Well, certainly, we very close friends, as a matter of fact, Al, I, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> Louise and I are going to be married. <laughs> married? Yeah, you know what happens when boy meets girl meets preacher. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to marry you, and she calls that loyalty. Oh, now, now just a minute, please. Oh, no, I... I didn't mean that. I wish you all the luck in the world, but, uh... Oh, uh, <clears throat> you're, um... You're going to have some sort of party to announce the coming event to the trade, aren't you? Well, it might be a good idea, Alan. Sure, sure. Of course, you won't be able to have it in her place. Lou's apartment is so small and uh, so out of the way, I hear. Huh? Well, you're small, yes, but her place is nearer this club than mine is. Oh, that's right. Sure, Barkman Place, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, oh, dear, you've lost your memory. Hmm? She's living on Northburn Crescent. Northburn. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> yeah, Northburn Crescent, of course. Let me see. It's uh, the numbers. Uh... Oh, 614. That was it. Six... Well, really? You're only 600 numbers off. Huh? Louise is at 1246, Northburn Crescent. 12... Oh, certainly 1246. Yes. yes, what was I thinking of? Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Furthermore, I haven't the faintest idea how you discovered where I live, but I didn't invite you. Thanks. I don't mind if I do have a seat. Ah, it's a very comfortable place you have here, Lou. Or have I said that before? You've gone over all the standard openings. Now you can leave. I've known you for almost five years, Lou, and I've always known in the back of my mind that when I was ready to let go and paint the town red, I was going to ask the union for an assistant painter like you to help me. <laughs> that particular part of your story you can include in your next book of collected fairy tales, Mr. Blake. For four years, I was part of the office furniture to you, like your desk. The only difference was you never scratched a match on me. <laughs> Ooh, I don't scratch matches on my desk anymore. I use that fancy lighter you gave me last Christmas. Mr. Blake, isn't it rather odd you're making nice speeches to me after you discover I'm both Stephen Stronghurst and Phoebe Sinclair? <clears throat> the only thing I discovered is that I'm in love with you. Now, what do you say to that? 
I dimple shyly and I murmur that you say the sweetest things. <laughs> At this point, am I supposed to act like Eve in purple petals and fall into your strong young arms with a strangled sob? Well, if you did, you'd be able to write a better book than Purple Petals. How Phoebe St. Clair and Stephen Shad Stronghurst can be one and the same person, Here I'd... is something easier. Your touching declaration of your feeling about me is three days too late. Three days ago, I decided to marry Joe Alsop. But you can't marry that... that... You can't marry Alsop when you're... Well, when you're... When I'm what? When you're in love with me, that's when. Why, you overbearing, conceited, rude, vain... I love you too, dear. <laughs> Why do you think that dill pickle proposed to you? Because he likes the tilt of your pretty neck when you're taking dictation? Maybe he wants to marry me Certainly because... not. You think he wants to marry you because the tip of your silly nose wrinkles when you laugh? He wants you because he wants to make sure your literary output goes to Alsop Brothers, that's why. Because you're dishonest and conniving, you think everybody is. Joe Alsop is everything you aren't. He's honest and upright, steadfast and reliable. Yeah, and a stodgy, complacent, cigar-swilling hippopotamus. <laughs> That proves you don't know what you're talking about. There is no such animal. All right. All right, marry him. But before you do, tell him you've just finished a new book you're going to let me publish. And then see how fast the love light in his eyes drops into a deep freeze. All right, I'll do that. I'll show you. Yeah, and let me be the first to know the happy outcome. Phone me tomorrow. I told you that the Martin correspondence is in Mr. Benson's office, Mr. Blake. Where are the Goodley files, Miss Jones? Where are the Lessing files, Miss Jones? Where are any files? All the files are in your right-hand drawer, Mr. Blake, where they've been for years. Hmm. Why didn't anybody tell me I had an important appointment with Gibson yesterday? Mr. Blake, on your appointment pad, circled in red and underlined, there was a note. I have no time to look at my appointment pad. Miss Jones, are you sure Louise hasn't phoned yet? Go on out to the switchboard and check the line to my office. Maybe it's out of order. Maybe... Well, she didn't have to slam the door that hard. Mr. Blake. Miss Jones, I can't wait. I want you... Louise... I see you haven't changed at all in your old habitat. Hello, Lou. I, I, well, welcome back to the old habitat. How are you? I'm a lot better than you thought I'd be at this time today, Mr. Blake. I told Joe exactly what you said. Oh, you did? And Joe changed his mind. I knew he would. We were going to be married in two weeks. Now he wants to get married Monday. Oh. I, well, Lou, I want to wish you, both of you, all the luck in the world. Thank you. Oh, by the way, as far as business goes, you can relax. I've decided to give my next novel to B&B &B if they want it. Well, that's very kind of you, Louise, and Benson will be very happy, but uh, there's only going to be one B in the name of this firm. I've decided to sell out. I'm not happy here. I need a rest. Oh. Well, there's nothing much left to say, is there? I, uh, I'll drop around sometime, both of you, won't you? Uh, tell me... How did you know the tip of my nose wrinkles when I laugh? Well, you just notice those things, I suppose, about, about people you like, I suppose. Do you really think I have a pretty neck? Now, what are you trying to do, Louise? I've said all I'm going to say, except that Joe is a very lucky man. Well, he doesn't seem to think so. I told you what he said. You want to know what I said? No, I'd rather not, Lou. Let's just part the best... I said if I married him Monday, I'd be committing bigamy. Bigamy? What on earth do you mean? Bigamy is having more than your legal rations of husbands, isn't it? <laughs> well, if I become Mrs. Allen Blake on Sunday, there's some law that'd frown Louise. on me. Louise. Louise, dear, did you say... <laughs> Darling! Please take me in your arms, kiss me, then go out and get a haircut and a marriage license. <laughs> Please, darling, do I have to do all those things? I... Oh, Angel. Oh, now, now, dear, I said you're to kiss me and mm. go out and uh, get a haircut, darling. I, I said kiss me and just kiss me, that's all. <laughs> Demanding on pause. Listen to them applause. <laughs> Thank you.
Next week, there's a corral full of Western fun for you and your family when another original play will be presented from the Little Theater. It's called Oh, Bury Me Not, a comedy romance you'll want to hear. Remember, next week, same time, same station. Join us then, won't you? And in the meantime, ladies, you'll never know how pretty you can be until you try Magic Touch. And now we move out of the theater and into the street. Cab, Mr. First Snyder. Thank you. Good night. Campana's First Nighter program, starring Barbara Luddy and Olin Soule, is a copyrighted radio feature. Tonight's play was pure fiction and did not refer to real people or actual events. Scratching an irritated skin can cause serious infection. If you're troubled with skin irritation caused by eczema, hives, winter rash, use DDD Prescription, the cooling antiseptic liquid that brings relief from irritating skin discomfort almost instantly. Ask for DDD Prescription. Trial bottle, 35 cents at any drugstore. The First Nighter program came to you over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Campana's First Nighter Program. From the Little Theater of Times Square. Starring Barbara Luddy and Olin Soule with an all star cast sent to you by Campana, the quality name in cosmetics. It's theater time on Broadway, and tonight we're to witness the biggest event on the Great White Way, the premiere of a brand new play in the little theater of Times Square. There'll be plenty of excitement, too, because the opening night performance is the crucial one, the evening when the public and the critics say yes or no to the play's bid for success. And now, here's our host for the evening, the genial first-nighter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just in the mood for a gay Broadway premiere this evening, are you? All right, here's my cab. Won't you step in? Okay, driver, to the Little Theater. Up Broadway, across 42nd Street, and into the glare and glamour of the dazzling lights that give the Great White Way its famous name. And now up ahead is the Little Theater off Times Square. Well, here we are. Isn't that beautiful creature over there, Dorothy McGuire? Someone say Governor Dewey's here tonight. Have your tickets ready, please. Have your tickets ready, please. Good evening, Mr. First Nighter. The usher will show you to your seats. Thank you. We'll go right in. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen. This is a packed house tonight. Because word is out that this evening's play is a comedy that no one wants to miss. And from the looks of the First Nighters crowding inside the theater, everyone is here to enjoy it. The program says the play is entitled, Oh, Bury Me Not, from the pen of Bud Baldus Jr. and Dick Bell. In the stellar roles are those two favorites, Barbara Luddy and Olin Soule, with Miss Luddy playing Anne Lane, a Texas rancher, and Mr. Soule taking the part of Billy Martin, a city-bred cowboy crooner. And what an all-star supporting cast, with Herb Butterfield as Mr. Lane, Hugh Studebaker as Laramie, Barton Yarbrough as Wild Bill Smith, and other well-known names. The famous First Nighter Orchestra is being conducted tonight by Frank Worth. And now the house lights are about to dim, so let's prepare to enjoy ourselves. Curtain! First curtain! There's the signal for first curtain. The house lights are out. And here's the play. In the sky are not cloudy all day. Well, folks, that's all for today. This here's Billy Martin a bringing you songs of the old west, singing them the way me and my buddies used to sing them round the campfire on the Lone Prairie. You've been listening to Billy Martin, the Texas Troubadour, brought to you by Zippies, the breakfast foods with vitamins A, B, sunshine, C, D, E, F, Oh, keep me away from the Lone Prairie. Mm-hmm. Come in. Ah, here I am, Mr. Lane. 
Well, what do you uh, want? Why, you sent for me. Well, I did. Yeah. I mean, why, yes, I did. Yes, sir. Uh, of course. Uh, your lucky day, isn't it? A brand new contract with Zippies at the salary of... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, $200 a week. 200 Gee. Yes, uh, sit down, uh, uh, Brubaker. Brubaker? Mr. Lane, I'm not Brubaker. Uh, you're not? No. He's the Zippies news commentator. You know, news and views by Brubaker. Then uh, who are you? Billy Martin, the Texas troubadour. Oh, well, in that case, you're fired. Oh. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, my boy, but the Zippies people have decided to cancel your uh, uh, show. Cancel my... My gosh, Mr. Lane, why? Ah, it didn't say. But, but just between you and me, I think it's your uh, uh, singing. You do? Uh, 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 yes. Uh, Brubaker? Martin. Martin. Uh, have you ever been in Texas? Well, no, but I go to all the movies. Well, that's not enough. Uh, 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 have you seen a large brown envelope around here uh, anywhere? Yeah, one sticking out of your pocket. Do, oh, oh, yes. Well, well, now here's a map of Texas with instructions for finding my ranch, the bar uh, X. Well, you're going to Texas? Uh, uh, no, no, you are. I am? Oh, yes. Uh, the, the bar X is run by my niece, uh, uh, Anne. Uh, she went to Vassar, but uh, if you spend two or three weeks there, my boy, get the feel of the West in your uh, voice, uh, I may convince Zippies they've made a mistake. Hey, not a bad idea. But no one must hear of this. Uh, since you're well-known, you'd better travel incognito. Yeah, anything you say. Uh, use a common, ordinary name like... Uh, Jones or Smith uh, or... Smith Br will do, yes, uh -huh. uh, Smith. Now, yeah. get going, Smith. Uh, uh, Martin. And I'll write Anne you're coming. You won't forget. Forget? Brubaker, my boy. I have a memory like an... <laughs> Good heavens, 10.15, had an appointment at 10. Uh, have you seen my uh, hat? Yes, it's on your head. Oh, oh, you hammerhead. Oh, Laramie. Good oh, morning, Miss Ann. Morning, Laramie. Thought I'd find you down here in the stable. Yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of on Diablo for almost an hour now. Laramie, I don't want you risking your neck. You're much too valuable to me as a foreman. Well, now, uh, since you put it that way... I... Laramie, do you remember Judge Carver telling us about Wild Bill Smith? Wild Bill Smith? Mm-hmm. You mean the rodeo rider? Yes, the one who claims he can tame any horse alive. Rodeo rider. Dead, blame, fancy pants... What about him? Well, he... He's coming to the Bar X. You coming here? What for? Well, someone has to break Diablo. So I wrote Mr. Smith, oh, and he's uh, agreed to take the job. What? what, what now, what, now no. you be careful. They say he's shot eight men. What for? Just because he didn't like the way they lit the cigarette. Is that a fact? And, Laramie, I want you to put a cot down here by Diablo's stall. A cot? M Miss Ann, you fixing a bunk down here in the stable? No, but Mr. Smith is. Judge Carver tells me that he won't sleep anywhere but with the horses. Well, I'll be. Yes, Mr. Smith must be quite a man. And I'll bet he's riding across Texas right now. The stars at night are big and bright. <coughs> Deep in the heart of Texas. Ah, Texas, beautiful Texas. Where men are men. Hey, that's right. Where men are men. Yeah, I mustn't forget. Well, howdy, ma'am. I sure am pleased to make your acquaintance. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that was a mighty fine supper, Miss Ann. Thank you. Beautiful night out, isn't it? Yep, she sure is. Sun's almost down. I just love these quiet Texas evenings. Yeah, so do I. Huh? Good heavens, what was that? Looky there, coming up the road. Oh, a car. That's the yellowest car I ever did see. Howdy, folks. Well, hello. Laramie, I wonder who Well, we'll is. soon find out. It. State your case, stranger. Oh, this be the Bar X, uh, uh, beant it? It be. <laughs> Who be you? Why, I thought, uh, I mean, uh, I reckon you always expecting me. Oh, are you Mr. Smith? Smith? Yeah, why, sure, sure, I'm Smith. Well, welcome to Bar X, Mr. Smith. Oh, thank you, thank you. I reckon you all are Miss Lane. Uh, Anne. <laughs> 
Mr. Smith, this is Laramie, my foreman. Howdy, Laramie. I said, howdy, Laramie. Fancy pants. Huh? And now, Laramie, don't mind him, Mr. Smith. It's just that, well, he doesn't like rodeo riders. He don't? That bother you, Smith? Well, no. No, certainly not. Why should it? Well, what part of Texas you come from, Smith? Uh, well, I'm not... Uh... You talk the queerest lingo I ever heard. Well, I'm from, uh... Dogged if you ain't wearing the fanciest cow suit in this whole panhandle. Yeah, right pretty, ain't it? First purple chaps I ever seen. <laughs> Bought them at Macy's. Here, have a weed. <laughs> now, what did I want with a weed? He means a cigarette, Laramie. Ah, oh, sure, a cigarette. Well, now, that's right neighborly. Oh, no, you don't. I don't what? You don't trap me. Fixing to offer me a smoke and then leave me have it, huh? Have what? Laramie, stop acting like a child and take Mr. Smith's suitcase down to his bunk. Well, if you say so, Miss Ann, I don't know what the weather's coming. Well, holy smokes, what's eating him? Oh, say, you must be starved. Yeah, I sure am. Well, come on in the house. Unless you'd rather eat in the stable. Stable? <laughs> no, no, the house will be fine. Well, good. You know, Mr. Smith, you don't look at all like the sort of person who sleeps with horses. Uh, I don't? Well, I'm sure glad of that. <laughs> and the curtain comes down to the first act of tonight's play in the Little Theater of Times Square. Smoking in the outer lobby or downstairs only, please. And now, here comes Larry Keating to tell you about the latest sensation in the world of beauty. Yes, Campana's new cream makeup, Magic Touch, is causing a real sensation. Excuse me. Hello? Mr. Keating, Boston calling. Here you are. But, but operator... Mr. Keating? Yes, yes? Mr. Keating, I think every woman in Boston must be buying Magic Touch all at once. You'd better send some more Magic Touch here soon or we'll run out. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, ladies. As I was saying... Hello? Seattle calling for more Magic Touch. Pittsburgh calling for Magic Touch. Detroit calling for Magic Touch. New York calling for Magic Touch. Los Angeles calling for Magic Touch. Calling. Des Moines. Magic calling. Touch. Chicago. Magic Touch. Calling. Denver. Magic Touch. Calling. Minneapolis. Magic Touch. Philadelphia. Good grief. And all I ever said was that you'll never know how pretty you can be until you try Magic Touch. Well, that's enough to arouse anyone's curiosity. Besides, you said that Magic Touch is new, different. It's a smooth cream makeup in an easy-to-carry white and gold compact. It's the new makeup for creating that new, unmade-up look. It brings new beauty to even the loveliest skin. Does wonders for ordinary complexion. That's what women want today. A new, a better makeup. Besides... You said magic touch is so easy to use. It puts magic beauty at your fingertips. You just smooth your fingers over the creamy surface of magic touch, apply a light film to your face, and blend. No powder puff, no water. It's simple, quick, and it gives your complexion the flawless Dresden doll-like quality that is so fashionable today. But what about powder? Do I need it after applying magic touch? No, if you want the new luminous look, and I don't mean shiny. Yes, if you prefer the dull, matte-like finish. You'll never know how pretty you can be until you try Magic Touch. It's only one dollar for the large compact. Only 39 cents for the special introductory size. So, be modern in your makeup. Give yourself a Magic Touch. Riders are hurrying down the aisles to their seats. The lights are dimmed, and here's the second act of Oh, Bury Me Not. Let's sit out here on the porch swing, Mr. Smith. Sure. Oh, I'm afraid I wasn't much company during dinner, Miss Lane. Or, Ann. Oh, that's all right. I knew you must be tired after that long ride today. Yeah. Oh. Driving a car can be quite a chore, especially when one's used to a horse. Uh, well, I wouldn't know about that. About horses? Mm. Oh, go on, Mr. Smith. What do you mean? Well, it's no use being modest. You, you're you quite a famous person in these parts. I am? Tell me something, Mr. Smith. Uh, yeah. 
Is it true that you've killed eight men? Why, well, sure, at least... What? What did you say? I said... Oh, but good heavens, you don't want to talk about it now, do you? Well, but, but, but... I'll bet you'd much rather turn in. Well, I am tired, Well, you wait but... right here, I'll get a lantern, then we'll walk down to the stable. The stable? Yes. All the way down there, in the dark? Certainly. Why? Well, because you're tired. Oh. Oh, sure. <laughs> Dark in here. I light the lantern. So this is a stable. What did you say? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, say, Anne. Yes. What's that funny smell? Why, horses. Oh. Ooh. What's that? Just Diablo. Who's he? A pretty mean horse, but I'll bet the two of you wind up good friends. You don't say. Well, I'm willing if and he is. Mr. Smith, what part of Texas do you come from? Your accent goes on and off like an electric light. Well, I don't... Hey, look. There's a cot in here. Yes, that's and where... And a suitcase. Well, it's... My gosh, who's sleeping here? Why, you are, Mr. Smith. What? We know you like to sleep in stables. You do? Judge Carver told us. He did? That's why we put your cot down here. It is? Yes. Well, I, I know you're tired. Oh, no, 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 I'm wide awake. Get a good night's rest. But, Anne. Because you'll need it in the morning. I will. Good night, Mr. Smith. Hey. Hey, Anne, come here. Holy smokes, what's this all about? Well, uh, you tell him, Dabo, old boy. Hey, you want to be friends, don't you? Here, I'll scratch you on the... Wow. Nasty disposition. Let me sleep with him? Huh. Oh, no, I don't. Get my suitcase. What I'll get, get out of here and sleep in the car. Whew. Boy, safe. Now to get to the... Running out, huh, Smith? Laramie. Had you tabbed all along. Hey, put away that gun. Go on, get back in that stable, Wild Bill. But, Wild Bill? Get, go on. You're riding that horse in the morning. I'm what? Like you agreed. Like I... Those eyes. He's insane. Get in there, Wild Bill. Yeah, yeah, sure, Laramie, sure, anything you say. Hey, hey, what are you doing? You're not leaving. I'll take the keys from your car to make sure. But first, I'm locking you up for the night. There's a stable, Tumbleweed. Ain't no sense of waking folks up this time in the morning. Who are? Who? All right, boy. I'll find us a place to bunker. My name ain't Wild Bill Smith. Hey. Hey, let me out. What's going on in that stable? Oh, gee. Well, what in hey, thunder was you... Shh. Who are you? Well, um, never mind, never mind. We've got to get out of here and get a sheriff fast. Hmm? Is there something wampa jolt, son? Yeah. There's an old nut running loose around here with a gun as big as a cannon. Well, holy cow. Say, is, uh, is that horse gentle? Oh, sure is. Well, can both of us ride him? He's built like an ox. Uh-huh. Well, then, let's get going, but be quiet. Oh, don't you worry none. I'll be just as quiet as a little old mouse. Mm. All right, Smith. It's more than your time's come. Just as soon as I get out of that stable, we're going to saddle that horse. Then we'll see just what kind of a fancy pants bronc busty. Well, I'll be. Stable doors wide open. Smith! Smith, where were you? He's gone. Cleared clean out. Why, that dirty, sneaking, two-headed maverick, wait till I get him with my gun. That's darn near day bus. Sun's coming up. 
For the love of Pete, how far is it to this town of empty saddles? Oh, just a mite more. You could see it if it wasn't for that big old cactus up ahead. Oh, can't this horse go any faster? No. Mighty strong, mighty slow. Gosh. Hey, um, just what was it going on back there at Bar X? Well, I'm not sure myself. Well, keep talking. Well, it was a pretty crazy idea from the start. Mm, go on. I feel silly even discussing it. I'm listening. Well, it's all Mr. Lane's fault. You see, apparently Laramie doesn't know that my... <laughs> that Martin's name is Martin. Huh. Why don't he? Well, because Martin said his name was Smith. That's right, Peculiar, because my name is Smith. Is that so? Mm. Well, you see, I guess Ann didn't tell Laramie that Smith's name is really Martin because Mr. Lane asked her to keep it quiet because... Well, uh, this is kind of confusing, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, anyway, this crazy Laramie got the idea that Smith said he'd ride a wild horse. Oh, is that the truth? Yeah. Mm. And get this. <laughs> he called him Wild Bill. Wild Bill? Yeah, isn't that silly? Are you telling me that there's a coyote on that ranch that's claiming to be Wild Bill Smith? Well... Why, that churn-headed siffy cat, I'll buy... Oh, no, 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 no. Why get excited? Because I'm Wild Bill Smith. You are. You're Wild Bill? I sure am, and I'll bet you your britches that there's some skunk back there aiming to get my job. Oh, holy smokes, I'm beginning And to... if I find him, I'm going to stomp his heart out. <laughs> You will? Whoa, that tumbleweed. Whoa. Wait a minute, what are you doing? I'm going back where we come from. But the sheriff. Sheriff, nothing. I'm going to handle this myself. But there's a feller on the bar X claiming to be Wild Bill Smith, and I'm taking you back to point him out to me so as I can kill him. <laughs> and the curtain comes down to the second act of tonight's play in the Little Theater on Times Square. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest that you stop and listen, for here is Larry Keating. All over the nation, women are stepping into stores and saying... Italian bomb, please. Italian bomb, please. Italian bomb, please. Because the ladies have heard that good, dependable Italian bomb is back again after its absence during the war. Back again with all of its original ingredients, all of its original goodness. It's so rich. So unlike thin or watery lotion. Nothing else seems to keep my hands so soft and smooth. It's such sure protection against chapping and dryness. Yes, Italian Balm is back again at no increase in price. Same quality, same quantity, same pre-war price. My, but it's economical to you. It spreads so widely over the skin. Just one drop serves both hands. Get your bottle of Italian Balm tomorrow. See how much prettier your hands will be all winter long. So soft so smooth. No matter how much housework your busy hands may do. So completely free of chapping or dryness. No matter how cold the wind or weather. Yes, women are saying... Italian bomb, please. Italian bomb, please. Italian bomb, please. are all in their seats, ready for the last act, and there goes the curtain. <laughs> Missed. Dog to find getting blind in my old age. Laramie, huh? what are you doing with that gun? Practicing. But why? Miss Ann, there's a snake around here somewhere. A snake? Yep, a two-legged one. Good heavens, where? I wished I knowed. Laramie, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I do. Well, never mind that now. Listen to me. Huh? The strangest thing has happened. Mr. Smith has disappeared. You don't tell me. His bunk in the stable wasn't even slept in, and he's nowhere on this ranch. Is that a fact? But his car's still here. Laramie, something dreadful may have happened yep. to him. We've got to find him. Yep, we sure do. <coughs> For heaven's sake, Laramie, put away that gun and come help me. Now, Miss Ann, you you ain't stuck on that two-legged, on that hombre, are you? Stuck on him? Yeah. Well, whatever gave you such an idea? Of course I'm not. Well, that's all I want to know. Because <laughs> if he comes crawling around here again, I'm going to shoot him on sight. <laughs> Well, 
It sure is a bar X, ain't it? Yes, yes, it certainly is. Ain't it? Well, get down off this horse, partner. Yeah, now, wait. Get down, Dad. All gummy. right. I'm down. Yeah. Where's everybody at? Uh, probably still asleep. Yeah, let's come back later, uh, huh? Sleeping, hmm? Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to ring your supper gong over here by the door and get them all oh, up. No, 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 don't. And then when this fella Smith that's claiming to be me shows up, you point him out, and I'm going to plug him. Oh, no. No, no, for God's sakes, wait. You know what? I got a better idea. Well, start the talking. Well, look, you hide in this little clump of bushes. See? What for? Well, I'll go around to the front door and tell him that somebody wants him at the back door. Oh, well, that's a good idea. Sure. Okay, well, now you keep out of sight. Oh, sure will. Oh, now to find somebody and explain what this is all Mr. about. Mr. Smith. Anne. Mr. Smith, where on earth have you been? Shh, don't call me Smith. Well, why not? Because Smith's back there looking for Smith. What on earth are you talking no, about? Oh, not here. Now, come on. But... Listen, Ann, listen. There's been a terrible mistake. Well, something strange is going yeah, on Yeah, well, here. you see... Laramie's been practicing with his gun for the last hour. Huh? Yes. He keeps saying something about uh, being after a two-legged snake. Oh, holy smoke, that'll be me. Oh, Miss Ann! There he is now. Hurry, Ann. Come on, back this way. Uh, I'm hurrying, but why? Uh, run the race. It's me. Quick, come on, around the back of the house. I wish someone would tell Get me... Get your what... hands up high. Good heavens, who's that? Smith. What? Never mind, never mind. Keep going. Wait a minute, partner. How come you didn't say Smith was a lady? I can't stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Uh Oh, this is it. Okay, Laramie. Reach for the sky. Who is that? Just do as he says. Why, sure, it's got to drop on me. Get away from them fellas, Miss Ann. And now, Laramie. Laramie, I can explain everything. Don't talk, son. But Laramie. I said be quiet, Smith. I didn't say a word. Well, who's talking to you, stranger? I said Smith. Well, I'm Smith. I'm Wild Bill Smith. How was that again, stranger? You're Wild Bill Smith, the rodeo rider? Well, I sure am. Then who... Well, I'll see you boys later. Get back here, oh, Smith. Smith. you mean he's the one... Now, listen, I can explain. Why, you... You imposter. You low-down copperhead out to plug you right on the spot. No. You keep out of it. Now, no shooting, Laramie. Oh, I'm not going to plug him. Oh, gee, thanks. No, I got me a better plan. Huh? Start walking toward the stable. Won't get. What? Smith, can you saddle the meanest critter on four legs? Oh, why, sure. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. That's murder. Keep walking, Buster. And? Imposter. Smith? Quiet. Well, here's the stable. Oh, no, now you don't know what you're doing. I can't ride that wild horse. Stop talking, son. Well, what the, what, what? Laramie, look. It's a big truck. It's running this way. Well, who on earth? Why, it's... Holy smokes. All right, then. Get this equipment set up right away. No time to lose. Uncle Jack. Mr. Lane. Well, well, and... Laramie. Sorry, Mr. Lane. Martin, my boy. Say, what's going on here? They're just trying to kill me. What? Well, I forbid it. I absolutely forbid it. But now, Mr. Lee... Now, uh, let me put away that gun at once. Well, you... You're the boss. Boy, Mr. Lane, am I glad to see you. Uncle Jack, who is this person? Yes, somebody tell me. Didn't I write you? Why, uh, this is Billy Martin, the Texas... Troubadour. The Texas Troop... The radio singer? Sure. Why, Mr. Martin, why didn't you tell us? My gosh, I've been trying to. Uh, Texas Trooper. Now, now, Smith, now. Why, shuckings, Mr. Martin, I sure am proud to know you. <laughs> I listen at you every morning while I eat my zippies. <laughs> zippies! Good heavens, hurry, not a second to lose. What's wrong? A mistake, terrible mistake. Huh? That's why I'm here. Why are you here? Well, Martin, I, I fired the wrong man. It was the other fellow, uh, 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 Brubaker, I was supposed to let go. Oh, for the love of... Okay, come, 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 now hurry. Uh, you go on the air in... Oh, good heavens, ten minutes. What are you talking about? Oh, well, you see that truck? That's portable radio uh, equipment. It is? Yeah, my boy, from now on, you're going to broadcast from this ranch. My gosh, I am. Well, Mr. Martin. And you have a brand new contract with Zippies at $500 a week. Golly, I have. All my idea. Brilliant. Uh, now, uh, one thing more. What, Uncle Jack? Uh, is there a horse anywhere uh, around? Uh, hmm. A horse? Uh, yes. Uh, there's Diablo. Oh, no. No, no, not him. Well, there's old Tumbleweed. 
Yeah, well, that's better, but why? Sensational idea, my boy. For the first time in radio history, a singing cowboy broadcasting directly from a horse's back. The skies are not cloudy all day. Well, folks, that concludes this first broadcast from old Tumbleweed. But before I sign off, I'd like you to meet the prettiest gal in Texas. We had a little misunderstanding, folks, but, well, I reckon it's all cleared up. What do you say, Miss Ann? I reckon. What would you say, Laramie? Well, I reckon. Uh, what did you say, Mr. Lane? Well, I'd say the three of you move up a bit. I'm about to slide off the rear of this uh, horse. <laughs> That's it, ladies and gentlemen. The curtain is down for the last act of another original Broadway play. It's Lottie and Mr. Soleil bowing to an enthusiastic little theater audience. If you want to hear a truly gripping play, one that will hold you spellbound for every minute of the performance, tune in next week for the drama entitled A Story Revised. Here's the kind of play that you hear too seldom. So join us next week, same time, same station. And in the meantime, ladies, remember that you'll never know how pretty you can be until you try Magic Touch. And now we move out of the theater and into the street. Is your cab, Mr. First Nighter? Thank you. Good night. Campana's First Nighter program, starring Olin Soule and Barbara Luddy, is a copyrighted radio feature. Tonight's play was pure fiction and did not refer to real people or actual events. Why take chances? Scratching a skin that's irritated by eczema, hives, or rash may cause infection. Don't scratch. Use DDD prescription a doctor's formula that brings quick, soothing relief from skin discomfort. Ask for DDD prescription at your drugstore. Trial bottle, 35 cents. The First Nighter program came to you over CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. And that's this week's Mutual Presents feature. The Mutual Audio Network brings the best of old-time radio and modern audio theater to the world. Be sure to subscribe through the Mutual Audio Network podcast feed, any of our podcast days, or the Mutual YouTube channel, which includes MadCon and many other extra features and shows. See you all next time at Mutual Presents. Good night.